Sir, I rise to support the bill moved by the Honorable Minister of Corporate Affairs, Sri Megwalji. Nearly 90 amendments proposed in the bill are mainly in pursuance of the recommendations made by the Company Law Committee based on the recommendations made by various industry bodies and industries and professional organizations. This House itself passed the Company's bill in 2013. And out of 470 sections, so far only 284 have been notified, and the remaining relating to National Company Law Tribunal and the National Company Appellate Law Tribunal, they could not probably be constituted earlier since the matter was sub judice. But a five-judge constitutional bench of the Supreme Court approved the constitution of the NCLT and NCLAT in 2015 itself. But why these have not been constituted is a big question mark, which I wish the Honorable Corporate Affairs Minister to please explain. Coming to the bill, some of the major amendments include providing greater flexibility in incorporating and running a company by simplifying the memorandum of association which and doing away with central government approvals, etc. To simplify procedures to raise capital, to rationalize penal provisions relating to auditors, improving corporate governance, and removing ambiguities in CR CSR provisions, etc. Sir, with your permission, I have a few points to make on the bill <coughs> and request Sri Meghwalji to ponder over them and take steps accordingly. The first one, sir, Clause 45 allows a relative and independent director to be indebted to the company or its promoters within a limit as may be prescribed by the central government. But I wish to make a point here. When the relative of an independent director is indebted to a company, the independence of such a director would be highly suspect, sir. Especially when a relative of an independent director is indebted to promoters of a company, independence of such a director becomes a definite casualty. Here, <clears throat> the government of India may prescribe a limit, but that limit is nowhere mentioned in the bill. I suggest while framing subordinate legislation, the limit should be kept at a minimum level, sir. Otherwise, it brings disrepute to the company and also hits its brand image in the market before its creditors. Sir, the next one. Clause 45 allows some pecuniary interest in companies for independent directors. The bill allows such directors on their own to have transactions with companies where they are independent directors up to 10% of such independent directors' total income or such amount as may be prescribed. It means, in a way, we are legitimizing self-dealing merchants as independent directors. I apprehend the limit of 10% transactions in the hands of independent directors can be altered by the executive action by prescribing an altered limit. Vested interests can achieve a higher limit by influencing the executive, sir. I feel that this would certainly weaken the independence on corporate boards. And you are also removing an existing provision which says that an independent director's relative should not have been a senior employee of the company in the last three years, and it may also impact the independence of the independent director, sir. Secondly, I beg to differ with the CLC, which says that such a small amount of income will have no bearing on the independence of the director. This assumption, in my view, is flawed. A threshold limit of the pecuniary relationship affecting the independence of a director cannot be objectively set, as the concept of independence is more subjective in nature. Objectively, the only manner in ensuring independence is adhering to the provision of, in the Act, which means absolutely no monetary relationship aside from the director's remuneration. The next, sir, refers to Clause 59. Sir, you are proposing to amend Section 185, which deals with loans to directors, etc. I wish to submit that a holding company, irrespective of being a public or private company, and without conditions imposed on the nature of its shareholding, can grant loans to its subsidiaries subject to the passing of a special resolution and the subsidiary utilizing such amount for its principal business activities. This may be a cause of concern because if the end use of the loan is still restricted to the principal business activities, it appears that in the case of loans required by the subsidiaries for purpose other than its principal business activities, 
holding companies may have to continue the current practice of amending its objects in its memorandum of association to include grant of loans to subsidiaries in order to have such loans granted in the ordinary course of business. Then claim exemption under subsection 3B of the proposed to be amended section 185, which exempts companies providing loans, guarantees, securities in the ordinary course of business provided the specific rate of interest is charged. But again, if the MCA intended to permit such an exception, it would have been reflected in the bill itself, sir. Secondly, the practice of amending the objects may prove to be risky. So I suggest for consideration of the Honorable Minister that the exemption notification must be amended to reflect the above relaxation under Section 185, and there should not be any confusion that public companies enjoy more liberty than private companies under the exemption notification. The next one, sir, is regarding Clause 60. Clause 60 of the bill seeks to amend Section 186 of the Principal Act by deleting restrictions on layers of investment companies. It also seeks to provide for aggregation of loan and investments so far made and guarantees so far provided for the purpose of calculating the limits of loans and investments. Further, it also seeks to provide that requirement of passing a special resolution at general meeting shall not be necessary where a loan or guarantee is given or where security has been provided by a company to its wholly owned subsidiary company or a joint venture company or acquisition is made by a holding company of the securities of its wholly owned subsidiary company. I agree that under the existing provisions, a company is not allowed to make investment through not more than two layers of investment companies. This clause eases the structuring of group companies and intercompany investments. I feel there is a need to put a limit on the number of layers, sir. Otherwise, I am apprehensive that this very proposed amendment facilitates rerouting of black money against which the government has, is waging a war, sir. And the second one is, you are going to create a structure where promoters can control large businesses with small holdings through a series of subsidiaries. If this is the objective of this provision, what would be the impact on corporate governance is my question to the Minister, sir. Sir, the next is regarding Clause 65. It is good that the Honourable Minister has removed the ceiling of 11% on managerial remuneration. But there is a condition that if a company has taken loan from a bank or any public financial institution is subsisting there is, or there is any default, then it has to take approval of that financial institution. If a company takes the loan, say, from 10 financial institutions, then it has to take approval from each one of them. And everybody knows that no bank or financial institution are going to agree to this, sir. But when it comes to private companies, there is no need to take consent of lenders, even if such private company has a running default with its lenders. So I feel this is sheer discrimination and request the Honorable Minister to relook at it once again. Sir, one final point I'd like to make. In response to rising NPA, sir, Minister Ji, this is an important point I'd just like to bring to your attention. With the rising NPAs, banks are now insisting on personal guarantees for every loan taken by companies. Personal guarantees of the promoters are being insisted upon. This goes against the very principle and nature of a limited liability company, sir. What's the point of having a limited liability company if every loan we have to take for the company, promoters have to provide a personal guarantee? That goes against this principle, sir. So in response to this, I believe risk-taking is coming down in our country, sir. And if risk-taking comes down, the dynamism of our economy depends on risk-taking capability. And I think that the dynamism of our economy also is at risk if uh, personal guarantees are insisted every time. There needs to be a balance. Accountability of banks also has to be there in doing their due diligence and evaluating the loans, need, uh, loans needs to be brought into focus. So what is the due diligence being done by banks? How are they evaluating the nature of the loan before giving the loan also needs to be 
brought into focus and the accountability of the banks also needs to be established sir is not only accountability has to be completely on the promoters who are taking the risk in the first place but the banks giving the loans also have to take some risk sir i think a balance needs to be maintained sir my conclusion there is no doubt that a large portion of the bill achieves its objective from providing clarity unambiguity transparency and certainty but there are some provisions a few of which i have mentioned which appear to have been contradicting to the core theme of the bill i only wish the honorable minister to relook at them once again closely and avoid this bill paving the way for rampant misuse of these provisions